السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم بعد بزيارتنا لسورة النصر في الفاتحة So the story is the uh, when the Prophet ﷺ received the ayah from Allah telling him to proclaim Islam and to make it known to his closest of kin, he started to call the tribal leaders of Quraysh, the clans of Quraysh and others. And when he called them, he went to a mount called Batha Mecca. Batha Mecca is a desert suburb of Mecca that is mountainous and it looks down on Mecca. So it is a high place. And uh, he climbed this little mountain as he was calling everybody and they gathered to listen to what he has to say. When he reached the top and they were listening, he started to tell them, listen, if I were to tell you that an army is coming from behind this hill, would you not believe me? They said, we would. Then he told them, then hear me out. I am a warner that comes from, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I am looking for you to support me so that I can deliver the message to everybody else. At that moment, Abu Lahab, who was called Abu Lahab because his face was so reddish, right? Even though uh, he had some blemishes. But in any way, they called him Abu Lahab because his face was as red as fire. So it was kind of like full of blood and vibrant, strong man. And he was another uncle among the uncles of the Prophet. We know that his uncle Hamza accepted Islam young and his uncle Abu Talib rejected Islam. His uncle Abu Lahab fought against Islam. But Abu Talib supported Islam and he called on the clans of Quraysh to support the Prophet against the enemies of Muhammad as a family member. He did not want to believe uh, because of his own personal reasons. He thought that if he believes, people would judge him as a follower, not a leader. So his status will be in question. So he refused, but he never wavered in defending the Prophet so he was defending the Prophet everywhere he can. On the other side, you find Abu Lahab, who from that point on started to declare his animosity and disdain and disrespect to the Prophet ﷺ. So he immediately told him, Ali hadha jama'tana, is this what you gathered us to say? As if he is belittling the purpose of gathering them to declare that he is the Prophet Wasallam, And from there forward, he started to follow the Prophet Wasallam in every place that he goes. So the Prophet Wasallam would reach out to the tribal leaders of Quraysh and other tribes in Mecca. He would go to them in their own quarters, in their own villages, in their own places, in the market and everywhere. So, here you have the Prophet ﷺ walking and saying, أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ أُعْبُدُ اللَّهَ مَا لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَهٍ غَيْرِ O people, worship Allah, you have no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And right behind him comes Abu Lahab to say, O people, don't listen to him. He is my nephew and he's a liar. Don't believe him. So the sentence coming to answer Abu Lahab did not come from the Prophet 
And Allah, in his answer to Abu Lahab, did not even put the Prophet ﷺ in the middle. He didn't tell the Prophet, tell him this and this and this. No. He told the Prophet, tabban lak, which means, may Allah put you to death. Okay? Tabban lak, ay halakt. So Allah SWT answers Abu Lahab saying, tabbat yada abi lahab wa tab. At-tab huwa al-halak. Tab means destruction, that you perish. You may perish, or he is just praying for his death. So Allah says, Tabbat yada abi lahabin wa tab. May Abu Lahab's hands be cut and perish. And may he himself perish. And that happened in this life. Abu Lahab was killed a few days after the battle of uh, Badr. Uh, when people came from the battle of Badr, he received some of them, and one of them was reporting, telling him, we were being killed right and left, and we were not killed by only people. We had white creatures in white thobes uh, killing us right and left. Whenever we turn our right side to the believers, the followers of Muhammad, we find others coming, to kill us, all of us. So uh, he objected to that uh, narrative and he started to attack this man and uh, uh, a lady, I don't recall her name at this point, but she came and she hit Abu Lahab with something that caused him to die in three days or so. So he died as a result of his resentment even to the news from Badr, he could not take it. He could not take the fact that somebody would believe that angels would come to support Muhammad or that the people who follow Muhammad are able to defeat the mushrikeen with all their you know, men and horses and camels and everything. So uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered on behalf of the Prophet And this is one example, and the Qur'an has so many other examples of what Allah SWT says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُدَافِعُ عَنِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا We uh, mentioned before the story of uh, the Prophet وسلم, sitting with his closest companion, Abu Bakr, رضي الله عنه وارضاه, and one man came and he started to attack Abu Bakr and his integrity and you are this and you are that and this. And Abu Bakr uh, is holding his temper and holding and restraining himself because the Prophet is sitting there. So out of respect for the Prophet وسلم, Abu Bakr stayed silent. And he kept looking at the Prophet وسلم, kind of like to get the Prophet to defend him, right? Because he didn't want to speak in his presence as if he's not there. But the Prophet ﷺ was only smiling. He was not responding to the man or to Abu Bakr's expectations. So after a while, and the man went beyond reason, Abu Bakr decided that I will defend myself. So he started to tell the man, what you said, I said, it was in answer to this and this and this, and this is not what I said. He started to explain his situation. As soon as he started, the Prophet وسلم, left. So Abu Bakr would not sit down in a place where the Prophet left, because he left all of a sudden, apparently not happy for Abu Bakr's answer. So Abu Bakr anh, thought that, the Prophet didn't like what he said. So he ran after the Prophet وسلم, and he told him, O oh, Messenger of Allah, he was attacking me baselessly and we both were listening and I was silent and you were smiling. And only when I started to explain my position that you stood up and you left, uh, I don't understand. 
So the Prophet وسلم, looked at him and he said, Ya Abu Bakr, O Abu Bakr, when he was attacking you and you were listening silently, the angels were defending you. As soon as you started to explain your position, the angels left. And when the angels leave, I cannot sit in any meeting. So that also is another situation where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would in person defend the Prophet وسلم, or by angels he can also defend the believers, right? And in the battle of Badr, Allah sent the angels also to defend the believers and to defeat the disbelievers. So the point or the lesson of this point here is Inna Allah yudafi'u which means do not think that you are defenseless and we should never think that somebody who is silent in the face of attack, in the face of defamation, in the face of character assassination, in the face of injustice, that his silence is a weakness. No, he is most probably, if he is a Muslim, then he is leaving his defense to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah does not let anyone down who leaves the matter up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So from the beginning of the surah, Tabbat yada abi lahabin wa tab, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cut his hand or destroy his hands and to destroy him as well. Ma agna anhu maluhu. وَمَا كَسَبْ Nothing of his wealth or his children are going to protect him or benefit him against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah decides that something happens to someone, wealth and uh, anything else do not stand in Allah's way to execute his will. So this is what happened to him in this life. He was put to death exactly as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. Of course, Muslim scholars explain in the interpretations that Abu Lahab, if he were to accept Islam after this surah, he would have rendered the entire Quran as false because it didn't happen. Here he said that I should go, be going to Jahannam, Sayasla Nar and that Lahab. But here I am. I'm accepting Islam. I'm following him as a prophet. I am praying. I am with you, the believers. So do you believe me or do you believe him? So it would have been a challenge. So Muslim scholars cite his perishing as a disbeliever, as a miracle of the revelation of the Qur'an. Why? Because Allah sentenced him both to death as a disbeliever and he sentenced him to hellfire when he still was alive. And he could have changed his mind. But this is evidence that whoever told Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that this man is ending in hellfire he must have control over everything that this man could not change his will. Nobody could change the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. مَا أَغْنَى عَنْهُ مَالُهُ وَمَا كَسَبْ His wealth and his clans and his children would not help him or benefit him in the face of that sentence coming from heaven. From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sayasla naran that alahab. Certainly he will be burnt in a blazing fire with its flames blazing around him and on his body. Sayasla naran that alahab. Look at this. Abu Lahab is punished by the Lahab. Right? His, his beauty of his face and shining face that is reddish 
out of health and blood and wealth, right? Allah is telling him, your fate will be the flames of fire. This is the flame that you will suffer from. وَامْرَأَتُهُ حَمَّالَةَ الْحَطَبِ his wife will be the carrier of the uh, firewood. She will be the one. Because she also was very helpful to Abu Lahab. <coughs> she would gather the branches of the trees with thorns and everything and put it on the path of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions, the believers. And she made it her life mission when this surah was sent down, she was going around saying, Oh, Muhammad has slandered me. Muhammad Hajani. Because she is looking at the Quran as if it were a poet. Because Al-Hija, in that time, to attack somebody, it takes a poet to do that. It is like the media heads of today, if they want to attack somebody, right, they grab his worst news and they spread it like dirty laundry. So they don't find anything against the Prophet ﷺ except Abu Lahab saying he's a liar, don't believe him. And his wife bringing those stuff in the path of the Prophet ﷺ so that she would make him sit in his place and do not roam Mecca and the surrounding villages. So she, she wants him to be put in his home and to be caged in his home. So Allah says, وَامْرَأَتُهُ حَمَّالَةَ الْحَطَبِ See, the, uh, the firewood that she used to gather and put in the path of the Prophet ﷺ, in Jahannam, she will be gathering burned fire woods and she will be putting it against her husband. She will be the one fueling the fire for her husband and for herself. So she found this to be an insult and she used to be known by the nickname Umm Jamil. Umm Jamil, the mother of the beautiful one. But the companions of the Prophet definitely don't like this nickname, so they gave her the nickname of Umm Qabih, that she is the mother of the awful one. So she became very furious against the Prophet ﷺ, considering that this is a defamation of her status in the community or her place in the minds of the community. So she would gather one day some of those firewoods and she says if I go out and I see Muhammad anywhere I'm going to throw this at him I'm gonna put it on fire so he was sitting with Abu Bakr and as they were sitting uh, this Hamalat uh, al-Hatab came with the firewoods and she was looking at them but and Abu Bakr was worried. He said, Oh, Prophet Muhammad, uh, if you could turn this side, maybe she would not see you. He wanted to be he himself facing her. If you, and the Prophet ﷺ told him, No, I'm not moving. She will be blinded. She will not see me. And that's exactly what happened. She was only able to see Abu Bakr and she was not able to see the Prophet ﷺ. Allah barred her eyes from seeing the person of the Prophet ﷺ. So she goes and she finds the Prophet is not sitting there. So she talks to Abu Bakr and she says, Where is your friend? He is spreading lies about me. He is slandering me. He is defaming me. And I said, No, he did not defame you. He spoke the truth. He spoke the truth. And she could not do anything, and she went back feeling that she is defeated. She did not achieve her goal of going after the Prophet ﷺ. Also, when 
when you see the rhyming of this short surah, tabbat yada abi lahab wa tab, lahab with the ba, tab with the ba, ma aghna anhu maluhu wa ma kasab, again rhyming, sayasla naran that lahab, so lahab also, wa amraatuhu hamalat al hatab, all rhyming. And then at the end, في جيدها حبل من مسد Rhyming, but with a different letter that comes very close to the ba, which is the dal. حبل من مسد This حبل من مسد that is a robe from hellfire that is made from things that are products of the fire uh, because she used to bring those woods tie them with uh, tree leaf ropes that are made of tree leaf material and she would wrap it around her head so that she can carry the wood so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in Jahannam in Jahannam she will certainly be with her neck necklaced with a robe from hellfire وَمْرَأَتُهُ حَمَّالَةَ الْحَطَبْ في جيدها جيدها means her neck so the proud way that she walked in Mecca carrying those thorns and firewoods and throwing them in the path of the Prophet ﷺ to trip him or to prevent him from roaming the, Medi- the Mecca she will be carrying those wooden stuff that are there in the hellfire and she will be tying them with a robe from hellfire around her neck. في جيدها حبل من مسد This is the end of the surah. If anybody has some questions, we can take some of your questions, inshallah. Masad is a robe that is made from leaf, uh, from branches of palm tree, okay? And they are turned around to become like a robe. Okay? And then they are used to tie things together. Like what you see when they gather the, uh, the wheat, right? And they tie the branches of the wheat with something from the branches itself. Yes. So it is a robe made out of palm trees. And it is very rough, by the way. Some say, no, it is made of uh, wool that is very rough, but uh, the tafsir, uh, more of the mufassirin, they say it is made of palm tree. Yes. Yeah, this is what we mentioned in the beginning, that because Allah apparently wants to answer Abu Lahab directly. So he did not relate the message to the Prophet ﷺ. Yes. And in this is the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he is the one sentencing him and the sentence is in the presence and in the face of the criminal. It is not related through someone else. Yes. How did they know? Because the surah, when it was revealed, the Prophet ﷺ recited it and dictated it to the Sahaba. So it became a spread in the community. It was known everywhere in Mecca. The question was, how did Abu Lahab know of the revelation of the surah? Yes. Any other question? I, my recollection is, yes, they died before, yes. The names are the ones that are known. The Ammu al-Abbas, he became a Muslim, okay. Ammu Hamza, his uncle Hamza, became a Muslim. Ammu Abu Lahab and Abu Talib, they never became Muslims. But Ammu Abu Talib was defending him. Ammu Abu Lahab, his uncle Abu Lahab, was shaming him and uh, attacking him. Uh, Did I forget anyone else? 
ابو جهل ابو جهل was not his uncle no ابو جهل yes no ابو جهل was not his uncle why did the quran why did allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use the past the apparent past tense well this is not a reporting to call it real past no this is a prayer against someone it is like when you say for example عميت عينك right you are praying for his eyes to turn blind you are not reporting so they don't call this past tense it's past structure but it is not a reporting format it's not صيغة خبر دي صيغة إنباء ودعاء and صيغة الإنباء والدعاء تأتي بصيغة الماضي لكنها ليست المقصود بها الماضي نعم so the uncles of the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم are listed here حمزة بن عبد المطلب العباس أبو طالب أبو لهب الزبير عبد الكعبة المقوم درار قثم المغيرة and some people added العوام and الغيداق no, one of them حمزة died in the battle of أحد not بدر yes Abu Lahab died after Badr. Yes. Okay, any other question? So let us talk about what benefits do we take from that story, from the surah. One of the things that uh, one has to take is that in the path of da'wah, if you live as a Muslim, you will face difficulties. Some people will hate you, some people will like you, some people will accept, some people will reject. So we need to be willing to live with all of the people's reaction, whatever it is. It doesn't mean that we accept it, it doesn't mean that we like it, but we have to recognize the reality. Allah has given every human being the free choice to believe or not to believe, right? What matters for us is to stay consistent on the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala no matter what the difficulties are. And for our children in particular, we need to teach them resilience in the face of objections. That they do not break at the first sign that his friends or her friends are rejecting them. They should not break down. They should not be uh, having a sense of defeat or isolation or anything else. Anyone who rejects the message of Allah, they are isolating themselves, not you. And while the Prophet ﷺ was one man in a community of thousands of other people, he never saw himself as a minority, despite the fact that he numerically, he and his followers were the minority. So you could belong to a minority in number, but once you add Allah to your side, better yet, once you add yourself to Allah's side, you are no minority, you are not weak. And you should never accept exploitation, manipulation, or pressure. You should stand tall on your own two feet, proud to be a Muslim, and to push back. And that leads me to another issue that we must do, which is, I cannot defend Islam, or myself as a Muslim, or my faith as a deen, a religion, I cannot defend 
on base, basis of ignorance. So I have to learn my deen. I have to learn my history. I have to be able to push back with knowledge and certainty so that no one else could crush me by raising an issue that I have no answer for. But even if you don't have answer, take the question, bring it to somebody that can help you get the answer and go back to that person and put the answer in front of his face. But never feel defeated. Never feel that you are a minority. I cannot do nothing. I'm only one Muslim in the whole school or the whole class. That self-defeating spirit is itself self-defeating. It doesn't need any fight. You will surrender before any fight. I'm not saying you should fight, but I'm saying you should fight back by pushing with your knowledge, with your manners. Let your manners speak for Islam. Let your tongue, let your ethics, let your principles tell others what Islam has taught you. It is not a good idea that I keep saying because I'm a Muslim and I don't know what being a Muslim means. We have to learn our deen before we can be able to defend it and explain it to others. Also, we need to trust Allah's promise that Allah is the one who makes truth prevail. I am not the one who is defending Islam. Allah is defending me and defending Islam. So, I am neither a victim of somebody's attack, nor should I accept to be a victim. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us two things in the Quran. One, he says, وَقُلِ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ Say the truth from your Lord. Where do I get the truth? I get it from Allah. I get it from his book. I get it from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it takes a lot of knowledge for me to say the truth. So not everything I think is true, it really is truth. No. I could think of something as the truth, but it may not match the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I may be just drawing the wrong relationships or misunderstanding and presenting it as if it is Islam. So before I put on my own words to defend Allah, His religion, His prophet, His book, I have to use Allah's word. I always say, let Allah speak to His creation. Always. Don't you think that your words will be smarter or better than the words of Allah? Which means we need everybody who could memorize the Quran to memorize the Quran so that the word of Allah will be ready to be delivered on the spot, not just later on and in another meeting, in another context. So the first one that Allah is telling us, say the truth from your Lord. The second position, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, بَلْ نَقْذِفُ بِالْحَقِّ عَلَى الْبَاطِلِ Nay, it is we who threw the truth against falsehood and it perishes it. It finishes it off. So all what we need to do is say the truth. Allah in his divine power will pick it and he himself said that he will be the one throwing it against falsehood. It is similar to what Allah says in Surah Al-Anfal وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَى You have not thrown. It's Allah who has thrown when you thrown. It's an amazing expression. When you threw, it was not you who was throwing. It's Allah who threw what you threw when you threw it. And the Arabs used to say, إِنَّمَا السَّيْفُ بِالسَّاعِدْ The power of the sword is not limited to the sword itself, but the arm that carries the sword. This is where the power is. 
So if Allah is the one who carries the truth and he's only telling us speak truth, that means it is incumbent on us to learn truth, to have it ready always, and to say it no matter what. Don't be inhibited or fear or to be scared by anybody. Another lesson is we should trust Allah to deliver us no matter how difficult the situation is. Imagine if the Prophet ﷺ were to think the way we do. He would say what? He would say, oh, here is my uncle. He is highly respected in the community. And he is running after me saying that I am a liar. And the more I declare the message, the more he comes and he says, I am a liar. And some people believe him. So I would better change what I am doing. No. Stay the course. Keep delivering the message. No matter how much objection you have or no matter what the source of, of objection may be. So that also is a lesson that we learn from the experience of the Prophet ﷺ. Another lesson is, even if Allah today does not send down Qur'an with the names of people that he will do this to them or he will do that to them, we should be assured that Allah defends the believers that the disbelievers who are fighting Islam, fighting Muslims, will be defeated eventually in this life and in the hereafter, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself says in the Quran, in Surah Ghafir, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna lanansuru rusulana. Certainly, we give victory to our messengers. Walladhina amanu. And those who believed. Fil hayatid dunya. In this life. So when we are defeated in this life, it is because of our lack of faith. Because if we believe in Allah, we follow His guidance. Al iman qawlun wa amal. If we believe in Allah, we follow His guidance. When we follow His guidance, no one could defeat us. When we gather around his book, when we promote his message, when we invite people to his mercy, and when we stay consistent, and when we offer the example that people should follow, Allah will make this example supersede everybody else. So we should never feel that because Muslims now are in the lower cycle of history, that, that Muslims are defeated or the battle is over or that people who object to the faith are uh, getting... So we should never feel defeated that we are down for a period of time or that we are little in number or little in equipment, or that our reputation has been mired in the mud as Muslims, or the Prophet is attacked right and left. You know that there was a wave coming mostly from Europe and from Islamophobes here in the past several years, especially after 9-11. Everybody is repeating one and the same song. Muhammad is, Muhammad is not. The Quran says this, Islam says this, Islam invites for violence, encourages violence, Muslims are killers, Muslims are... Okay, there will be time when they finish their songs, right? And it will subside and the truth will prevail, but we have to be persistent. We have to outlive what they are doing. And the Quran makes no secret about how we do that. The last ayah of Surah Al-Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, isbiru, be patient. Wa sabiru, sabiru is sigat mufa'ala. 
which means let your patience following the truth be greater than their patience following falsehood. This is a battle. It is like what, what is called now Abdul Asabar, finger biting. Okay? Who's going to, to cry first? Right? Who's going to withdraw? If we hold on to our patience because we know we are following the truth, they cannot hold for long following their falsehood. And if they do, at the end, Allah says, they will be defeated. So one of the lessons here that the Prophet ﷺ believed and followed is the kuffar will be defeated no matter how strong they may seem on the surface. And what is amazing, <laughs> something that we should really think about. You know the war in Afghanistan which started in the early 80s, right? When the Soviet Union invaded. So the Soviet Union ended up in Afghanistan going out broken down as a Soviet Union, right? Where is Afghanistan? Afghanistan is still in place, right? <laughs> then the stupidity is America comes and thinks that they will outdo them. So they go for 20 years. Then what happened at the end? <laughs> it's, it's a laugher. You know, it's, it's a laughing issue. It's a, but, but we Muslims, unfortunately, like to focus on our weaknesses and the strength of our enemies. Do you know why? Because we're not counting Allah on our side. And that's because we are not standing on his side. So we need to change position. We need to stand with Allah and with the forces that work for Allah and push back as much as we can and let Allah decide that this war is his, not ours. He will show us the signs. Also, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises hellfire for the disbelievers, they are not far from his punishment in this life also. And the way he does it is every empire that went on a tyrannic rampage in history has fallen apart. They have broken down. So no matter how many empires we live to see, they will also be broken down because this is the rule of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as much as the Prophet ﷺ believed Allah when he told him the history of other communities and other empires that came before Islam, he was so sure that the empire of Christ will crack down and will be broken. The empire of the Arab money and the wealth of the Arabs will be broken down. And all the power came back in the hands of Allah. And Allah empowers those who follow him. Those who defend his cause. In Tansurullah, Yansurkum. So those are some of the lessons that we can draw from this very short surah. As you see, uh, the text may not speak so many words, but if you get deeper, you find examples and issues <coughs> that we can benefit from in our daily life and in our community life. Any other question? So if there is no question, we can go for the other, inshaAllah. Zakallah khairun. Subhanakallah muhamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa ant. نستغفرك ونتوب إليك والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر